I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime, and this is Currents. In the midst of scandal, the Vatican takes a dramatic step to reform one religious order. We'll go into the deep with Bishop DiMarzio to kick off the month of Mary. We can look at Mary as, as a symbol of God's love. It's a popular tradition, and we'll look at how it's practiced in one Eastern culture. We like to use our language and the like, fact that we're, we're Catholic to bring all these people together. Well, good evening. Thanks so much for joining us tonight. Amid widespread news about sex abuse in the church, the Vatican has announced some major changes for a prominent religious congregation, the Legionaries of Christ. That follows the widely reported incidences of misconduct by the Legionnaires founder, Marcial Macial, including sexual abuse of seminarians and using the congregation's funds to support a woman and the child he fathered with her. Rome Reports has more. The Pope will appoint a delegate and form a commission to study the constitutions of the Legionaries of Christ. The Vatican announced those measures to help the religious order confront the crisis amid revelations about the life of its founder, Marcial Maciel. Benedict XVI first thanked victims for coming forward and reporting abuse by Maciel. The Vatican called Maciel's actions, quote, a life devoid of scruple and of genuine religious sentiment. Reportedly, Maciel built up alibis to gain the trust, confidence, and silence of those around him and to strengthen his role as a charismatic founder. The Vatican also announced it will investigate the Regnum Christi and has set forward three main objectives for the future of the Legion. The first is to define the Legion's statues, which will maintain the core of the Militia Christi, on which the order is based, but put an end to the sense of efficiency at any cost. The second objective is to redefine the secrecy within the order. The actions of the superior of the Legion should not be kept secret. The final objective is to encourage legionaries to maintain their enthusiasm and their faith at the center of their formation. The Vatican underlines the Pope's five investigators have found great collaboration and have been welcomed sincerely. It also says that aside from its founders' deplorable actions, the Legion is made up of a great number of religious who live exemplary, honest lives, many who have given their lives to God in a sincere manner. The Pope has shown his support for the Legion and the members of the Regnum Christi. He's assured them that the Church will be with them through this difficult period of purification. The Legion has said it's willing to follow any guidance from the Vatican. Right now, the Legionnaires have more than 800 priests and 2,500 seminarians worldwide. Its lay arm, Regnum Christi, reportedly has close to 70,000 members all around the world. Mm. Well, to put all this news in perspective, I spoke earlier today with Currents contributor Rocco Palmo. He's also the author of the popular blog, Whispers in the Loggia. Well, Rocco, thanks so much for joining us here once again on Currents. We appreciate your time today. Anytime, Matt. Well, how big of a deal is this? Of course, we're talking about the Legionaries of Christ. We've just been brought up to date by our friends over at Rome Reports and uh, we've kind of been, been uh, brought up to speed there. But how big of a deal is this? Can you put this in perspective for us? Hey, well, this is uh, on several fronts. This is a big deal. For one, in terms of uh, prominence in the Church, the Legion was arguably the favorite religious community, religious movement of Pope John Paul II. Mm. So, uh, and were brought to great prominence, came from essentially out of nowhere in John Paul's pontificate to have, you know, bishops and other, uh, uh, you know, uh, senior members of the Roman Curia were legionaries of Christ. Father Maciel was a regular visitor to the Pope. Uh, anytime the Legion, you know, the Legion, it was always said that in Rome they would occupy the first couple pews, at, uh, uh, or the first couple rows at every papal audience because John Paul loved seeing the Legion so much. But in terms of also, again, in prominence in the global church, the last time a religious order had this sort of intervention from the Holy See came in 1981 when John Paul II imposed a delegate uh, of his choosing on the Jesuits. So anytime, any, you know, the Jesuits are the largest order of men in the church, so anytime anything comes, you know, uh, could be compared to that sort of a scale of intervention, it's massive. Right, right. Wow. <laughs> well, is this, do you think, I mean, from your experience and from your observation here, 
Uh, do you think this is kind of a signal of, you know, from the Vatican, and maybe we're not going to take this kind of thing anymore, you know, this, uh, you know, this being amid the, the wider abuse crisis that is, uh, you know, kind of engulfing uh, the church, at least as far as the press coverage goes right now? Well, remember, Matt, this is for, for the Pope, who himself appeared at the meetings on, uh, on Friday and Saturday. Uh, this, Father Maciel was a red flag uh, to him for a very long time. I mean, he tried to have Maciel investigated back in the late 90s and the early 2000s, and uh, was actually, according to multiple reports, rebuffed by uh, John Paul Sr. aides. So I think, you know, that the context of the moment in terms of the sex abuse crisis being on the front pages kind of adds to that, to that prominence of the story. But again, this is something that the Pope has, in stages, been working on for 10 years. Well, what do the legionaries have to do now? What are the next steps for them? And I mean, really, where can the order wind up, you know, say years down the road? Well, the first step is obviously the next couple of days is the Vatican announcement there. The Pope will name uh, a, a delegate, someone, you know, either who may even be a legionary, but who more likely will be some sort of retired bishop, um, to oversee with full papal power the legion, and essentially to, I'm sure with Pope's close supervision of the whole thing, uh, you know, go over its statutes, go over all of its, you know, all of its customs and everything, with a fine-tooth comb, taking out anything that may be seen as suspect. Um, but this is just the beginning of a process that's going to take easily um, three to five, maybe even ten years. Mm -hmm. So, uh, And it's going to end up with a completely different community than the one um, which Father Maciel left behind. Yeah. All right. Well, Rocco Palmo, thank you so much, Currents contributor and author of the blog Whispers in the Loggia. We really appreciate your time today, sir. Anytime, Matt. Thank you. Thank Take you. Care. Well, stay tuned. There's much more Current straight ahead. Thousands have traveled to see it, and now so is the Pope. We'll have that and the rest of the day's headlines. Plus. It survived an atomic bomb, and now, for the first time, part of a special statue comes to New York. Welcome back to Currents. I'm Francesca Maxime. And I'm Matt McClure. Coming up in just a bit, a devotion to Mary from an Eastern perspective. But first, let's have a look at the day's headlines. Pope Benedict prayed before the Shroud of Turin in Italy Sunday. The Shroud is a piece of linen many believe was the burial cloth of Jesus. It's on display for the first time since being restored in 2002. During a message delivered after his prayer, the Pope said, Each trace of blood speaks love and life. Nearly two million people have traveled to the city of Turin to view the Shroud so far. It will remain on display in the city's main cathedral for three more weeks. The president of France has caused some controversy recently by calling for a ban on veils worn by Muslim women, and now some politicians in Belgium are following suit. A bill that would ban the face-covering garments known as burqas passed the lower house of the Belgian parliament last week, but reports say the bill faces a tough battle in the Senate. The bill's author says burqas are incompatible with basic security because everyone in public needs to be recognizable. Closer to home, as immigration continues to be a hot topic of discussion, the U.S. Bishops Conference says it welcomes the immigration framework presented by Senate Democrats, except for provisions dealing with same-sex relationships. The bishop said in a statement that the framework is an important first step toward comprehensive reform, but that a final bill must be bipartisan and affirm basic human rights. The bishop said they strongly oppose what they say are marriage-like immigration benefits to same-sex partners and warn the provision threatens to derail the entire legislation. Well, five Torahs, which were stolen from a Brooklyn synagogue last week, have been returned. Police say the sacred scrolls could be worth as much as $250,000. Reports say cops struck a deal with the friend of a suspect who then returned them to the synagogue without revealing the name of the thief. The Torahs were taken during a break-in last week at Carlsberg Synagogue in Borough Park. There are no charges expected. And finally, it's an artifact that survived a nuclear bomb almost 65 years ago. And now it's in the United States for the first time. A remaining piece of a statue of Mary from the Japanese city of Nagasaki was at St. Patrick's Cathedral in Manhattan yesterday. And our cameras were there.
I came to New York as a pilgrim of peace with this statue of Mary. Mary, the Hibaksha, as we call her, was discovered in the ruins of the Cathedral of Nagasaki shortly after August 9, 1945. The U.S. Conference of Bishops has promoted the policy goals of preventing proliferation of nuclear weapons for many years. I share the same commitment and would like to make a strong appeal for a world without nuclear weapons. Uh, the bomb, at, atomic bomb, s destroyed everything, huh? uh, the uh, buildings and the natures and the people, everything, everything. The humanity doesn't, uh, sh shouldn't make any nuclear weapons. We don't need it. Violence just begets more violence. It's not going to, uh, it's not resolving anything. And today, the message from Jesus was to love one another. And we can't love one another when we're killing them. And uh, we can't love each other when we kill each other. I hope, I do hope that there will be a war with that nuclear weapon. I really hope so. Nagasaki should be the last place that was bombed. Archbishop Takami planned to meet with UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon today to present him with a petition calling for strict limitations and eventually an entire ban of nuclear weapons. Stay tuned, there's more currents coming up. Just ahead, she's the most popular saint, and Bishop DiMarzio sits down with us to talk about her. She becomes our own mother, to whom someone we can go to find that compassion and the courage that we need. Welcome back. Well, it may be hard to believe, but it is already May, and it seems like just last week we were shoveling snow, but this month actually kicks off a very special time in the Catholic Church. It is a month devoted to Mary. And we're going to be actually spotlighting some of that here on Currents. And to help us put all of this into context, we're going to put out into the deep now with Bishop DiMarzio. Bishop, thanks so much for being here again. Good to be here. Always nice to have you in studio with us here on Currents. And um, of course, this being the beginning, the first weekday today of, of the month of May, as, as we begin this month, of course, it's uh, devoted to honoring Mary. Tell us a little bit about your own personal devotion to the Blessed Mother. Well, I think uh, my devotion to Mary started as a, as a child uh, uh, with my own family and certainly in school. We came to know the place of Mary in our lives as Catholics. It's a very special place we have. I think, again, it's uh, interesting that many times we have our idea of God, God as a father, uh, sometimes the wrong idea that God is somehow has got a big computer up there and he's uh, <laughs> noting everything we did wrong. <laughs> it's not quite the same thing we think about Mary as our, our mother, our Heavenly Mother. Uh, there's more compassion, there's more of an understanding of, of um, forgiveness, perhaps, uh, as our own mothers teach us th these things, you know. Um, and, and so why do you think then perhaps the devotion to the Blessed Mother is so important today, specifically in this day and age? Well, I think we, all, we need it all the time. I think especially in a world like our own where we find uh, little tolerance at times for things. Uh, I think we can look at Mary as, as a symbol of God's love uh, and showing that love as she, she did in her role as uh, Jesus' mother. Uh, she becomes our own mother, to whom someone we can go uh, in the difficult moments of life to find that compassion and the courage that we need. Mm. And what do you say to parishioners just on a on a day to day basis if someone might come up to you and say, Bishop, how can I foster my devotion? How can I how can I just improve that uh, devotion to Mary, make it better? Probably the the easiest way and the most certain way is the recitation of the Rosary. It's the simple prayer, but at the same time brings us into contact with all the mysteries of the life of Jesus seen through the eyes of Mary. It's, it's a prayer of, of the peasants and of the, of the great uh, minds. There's a, a story told about uh, Pasteur. He was on a train in, in France and uh, saying the rosary. And this young man across from him uh, said, why are you doing that? I mean, uh, um, you know, that, that's old fashioned. That, that doesn't make any sense. And, and he argued with him a bit. So as he left, the pastor took a card from his pocket and gave it to him, and it was Louis Pasteur yeah. who mm. was saying the rosary. 
So I think that's that things like that. It, it's for everybody, you know, it, because it's a meditative prayer. It's how we can understand uh, the mysteries in Christ's life, and that we see them through the eyes of Mary. It's for everybody. Yeah. And and also, the Holy Father is actually preparing to visit uh, Fatima later on right. uh, this month. Tell us a little bit about the significance of Fatima and also of uh, Mary's messages there to the world today, if possible. Well, I think the apparition of Mary at Fatima to the three children there speaks to us today. It was the beginning of the, the last century, at a time when the world was in great conflict. The world war was waging there, and uh, we saw that there was a need again for a message of repentance, a message of comfort at the same time, um, drawing people back to the practice of their faith, because that time in Portugal was one where there was a lot of anti-clericalism, which resulted in a lack of practice of the faith. And it's interesting about all Marian devotions, um, they all happen at a time when something is needed, mm. when the, the, the Word of God needs to be uh, put forth in a certain way. And th this is clearly the message of Fatima, devotion to Mary through the recitation of the rosary, uh, repentance for sin, uh, an understanding of a complicated world at that time, and it got more complicated since but that God is always with us, and Mary, our mother, brings us that message of God's compassion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, and then, uh, you know, especially today, I'm sure with economic conditions the way they are, and, you know, wars waging across the world, it's a message that, that people really need to hear, and kind of, they may not know it, but inside they might be longing for that. It's true. I think, you know, I, I, everybody comes to a point, especially in desperation of science, that says, I need my mother. Yeah. Well, yeah. you know, this, <laughs> we need Mary. Yeah. Sure. That's our mother, uh, Heavenly Mother, and we should, you know, call upon her and, and as an intercessor for us. Uh, I was mentioning before there was an interesting dialogue that was just reported between evangelical Christians and Catholics on the subject of Mary, and there was a, a lot of agreement, some disagreement, but a lot more agreement than I thought. Mm -hmm. So I think that it, we see that all Christians now are coming to understand our, un, our devotion to Mary, not as idolatry, obviously, right. but as a true understanding of God's relationship to us and how we can understand that relationship better through the human terms that we know, mm -hmm. especially maternal love. Right. Very nice. Well, thank you so much, Bishop DiMarzio, for being with us here again okay. on Currents Today. Thanks. When we come back, we will take you to a unique Marian devotion that took place over the weekend. When we return, the traditions of the East have a place to call home in one Queen's neighborhood. We just heard Bishop DeMarzio share some of his thoughts about Mary and the devotion to Mary during this month of May. Well, now you're about to see that in action. It's a special procession for Our Lady of Shishan. Shishan is in Shanghai, China, and it's home to a basilica dedicated to Mary. Shishan is also a place where persecution has been severe, but where faith has survived. Yesterday in Queens, the Chinese Apostolate took time to celebrate that faith and its devotion to the Blessed Mother. of Shishan refers to Our Lady, a help of Christians. It has become kind of a symbol of uh, the resilience of the Chinese Catholics. <laughs> this particular statue was placed on top of the church and uh, the church has been made a basilica. That church was taken away by the cultural revolution. The procession is so important because while there is a dispersion of the Chinese people throughout the United States, more and more Flushing has become a center. And now they are seeing that Our Lady of Shishan is not only present, but encouraging them via, via this procession, it will cause them to grow and to be attracted more. 
there aren't that many um, Chinese like Catholics. Um, so when we have these things, we like to use our language and the like, fact that we're, we're Catholic to bring all these people together. Basically, we kind of go to all the churches and we do the rosary, and it's just kind of honoring Mary. Because it also helps us bring other people uh, to our church. The Lady of Shoshan means a lot to me, because ever since when I was a little boy, uh, my mom has brought me up to knowing the Lady of Shoshan. We all share the same pain, you know, the heat, the pain in the feet walking, two hours. Um, but I thought it was a great experience. Uh, it helps our community to bond. As we all wore these, we were as one. You know, when you see that, you, you can't help but think how lucky we are to live in such a diverse city where you get to experience so many different cultures. And, you know, in this case, uh, uh, an Eastern culture, but you know, observing, um, you know, Catholic, uh, the, you know, the Catholic faith mm -hmm. in their own way. As the girl said, they're with their own language and, and through some of their own traditions. It's very, very cool to be able to see. I can really appreciate that. And, and I think that's what's so unique about Brooklyn as a whole and the Diocese of Brooklyn and all the different apostolates that we have because each one has all the different yeah. cultural traditions. And we've really tried to showcase that on Currents. And I think that we've done a pretty decent job of at least beginning to highlight all of the different things that different people can do yeah. whether it's a way of prayer, different traditions, cultural things, um, but still maintain that faith. Stuff you might not have even known was going on. True. <laughs> and there it is, right there in your backyard. <laughs> Welcome back, by the way. I just wanted to say that to you. I've, I've, I've grown tired of talking to myself over the past and, <laughs> week know, or so. And I missed you, too. And it, it's <laughs> nice to come back. I actually had a nice, restful staycation. I nice. didn't really leave New York, but, uh, it, you know, it's just nice to sort of step back, actually, and take a moment to reflect right. in whichever way, and then come back and see things with fresh eyes, including this show and, um, yeah, and you as well. So it's always great to be here. <laughs> well, that is it for tonight. Tomorrow, a surprise bestseller that takes a satiric look at atheism. Meantime, remember, we are always online at CurrentsNY.net, and you can also follow us on Twitter. You can also become our fan on Facebook. Indeed you can. Until next time, I'm Matt McClure. And I'm Francesca Maxime. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a great night.